So good morning to everyone. Uh, my name is Rafa Murais. I will be making a first presentation on behalf of Acer for approximately 25 minutes. Um, I, I hear some background noise, so I would ask participants to mute their micro. Thank you. Um, so maybe first to manage expectations. Today, we will not be discussing a specific alternative configurations. Uh, what we will present today is the approach, the methodology that Acer, as Christoph mentioned, intends to apply to define alternative bidding zone configurations for the upcoming bidding zone review. Uh, as mentioned also by Christoph, and in previous occasions, this approach will be described in a document and subject to a public consultation in the next coming weeks. Um, in terms of content, my presentation has two parts. I will first provide some background on the bidding zone review process. And second, I will describe our proposed approach to identify configurations. We can now move to the next slide. Please. Thank you. So first, I, I will provide some background. So first, starting with the basics, what are bidding zones and why it's important to review them? So as everyone or most of you know, a bidding zone is the largest geographical area within which participants can trade without any constraints or with infinite corrosional or with infinite capacity. And as we can see in the map, uh, bidding zones in Europe today are currently defined according to national borders mostly, with the main exceptions applying to the Nordics, Italy, and if you like also Germany together with Luxembourg. Uh, the European electricity target model poses a, a challenge to Europe's status quo as it proposes that bidding zones, rather than being defined by national borders, are defined by network congestions to the extent possible. And also it's important to remind that pursuant to electricity regulation, more specifically Article 14, um, it formally launched a bidding zone review at EU level. We can move to the next slide. Thank you. With regards to the process, uh, the electricity regulation also defines the steps and responsibilities uh, clearly, at least for this process, for this review. Uh, first, TSOs uh, already proposed a methodology and configurations. Then, NRAs um, are request to approve, requested to approve unanimously or refer to ACER uh, this, the adoption of this methodology and configurations, as it was the case, so it was referred to ACER. Uh, following that, TSOs will conduct the bidding zone review study. This will be next year. And finally, EU member states will decide on whether to change bidding zones or not. We can move to the next slide. This is just to say um, that, as most of you know, TSOs submitted a bidding zone review methodology to ACER, but they did not agree on configurations to be studied, or at least not for continental Europe. And in view of this, uh, the decision of ACER was split into two. Uh, first, we already decided on a methodology last year. And also in this decision, we asked TSOs to perform a nodal price simulation or LNP, locational marginal pricing simulation, for ACER to take an informed decision on the configurations to be studied. TSOs are currently undergoing the, the simulations and ACER will decide on, on configurations during the first quarter of next year. Now, moving to the next slide, and I'm starting to go a little bit into the substance. First, I will re refer to some choices or some reflections that were already made in preceding decisions or, or months or work, previous work of the agency. First element to, to have in mind is that there are typically two sort of extreme, if you like, ways of delineating configurations. One extreme possibility is a pure expert based approach, whereby a set of experts essentially propose possible configurations based, based on, on, on their best knowledge. Another extreme way is to just use a purely, purely model-based approach that would only rely on market or network simulations, for example, nodal price simulations, LMP simulations, together with, for example, clustering techniques to group nodes into homogeneous uh, or optimal uh, uh, configurations. An expert-based approach may be a pragmatic way of defining configurations, we agree on that, but in particular when there is experience 
and when there is a possibility for consensus among experts uh, that can be reached. In the absence of this, and this was um, in principle the case for most of Europe, it was decided to use a model-based approach, but subject to some boundary conditions or delineation constraints uh, to which I will refer later. We can move to the next slide. Well, this is a bit um, a summary, summary of, of previous reflections or work of the agency in different decisions and uh, methodologies. And it's a remark to mention that when delineating between zones is necessary to investigate, to investigate both the physical and the commercial aspects of congestion. A frequent misconception is that uh, the location of physical congestion is enough to determine where the building some borders should be set. Uh, this might hold true in some specific sort of network configurations, but in general, in mesh networks, this is far from being obvious. And these two examples try to illustrate that such a statement does not always uh, hold true or does not work. In the example of the left, the physical congestions in red are on the border between building zone B and building zone A. However, those congestions are, would be the result of mainly exchanges in B, causing, in this case, loop flows. And if this analysis is not done, this link between the physical and the commercial reality, one could lead to the wrong conclusion that the bidding zones are well-defined, while this wouldn't be the case. The example on the right, and of course, these examples are extreme, and we don't intend here to reproduce realities as illustrative examples. Uh, but this just to give a flavor on, on why the importance of linking these two aspects. So it would be the same example as on the left, but in this case, exchanges within A would be causing physical congestions on bidding on B. And again, uh, the link is relevant, and it is important not only to look to bidding on A, where the physical congestions are, but also to the origin of those congestions. So all in all, in both cases, and in practical uh, cases in Europe, Identifying the cause of the physical congestions is necessary. For example, when it comes to, to methodologies such as uh, the setting of redispatch costs, uh, but also necessary to propose alternative configurations. I will now move to the second part of my presentation where I will describe, so we can move to the next slide, the high level approach that ACER intends to follow with delineating configurations. We, we can move one more, please. So first of all, as usual, cannot be otherwise, we need to look at regulation. On this aspect, we have first the CACAM regulation that establishes a set of criteria to be studied during the beginning of review study itself. However, the CACAM regulation is rather open uh, or silent or not explicit at least on the element that should be considered to delineate configurations and this distinction needs to be clearly made. Um, in this respect, the electricity regulation is a bit more precise or more specific and refers to the following three elements to be sought when defining configurations. First one, um, also mentioned somewhat in the CACAM regulation, is the need to minimize, uh, assuming that it's not possible to make them completely disappear, but minimize the structural congestions laying within building zones. So structural congestions, if they exist, they, are, they should not be completely uh, eliminated, uh, but they should lay to the extent possible uh, within building zones. The second principle is the principle of maximizing economic efficiency, and the third principle would be the principle of maximizing cross-zonal trading opportunities. In this respect, with respect to maximizing cross-zonal trading opportunities, the electricity regulation establishes a new link uh, or a new aspect that is the uh, that comes into play that is the 70% target and the link is there because if the target is not met this could potentially lead to a bidding some change uh, according to article 15.5 of the electricity regulation and finally uh, also importantly the electricity regulation sets the time horizon for the study of the bidding some review to be three years after the bidding some review starts and this is also a relevant aspect to be considered when uh, looking at the relevant scenario in uh, the bidding zone review, but also to some extent when uh, anticipating uh, the relevant configurations to be studied. 
Now I will move to the next slide to let you know what is the data available to Acer to decide because of course if we are to decide based on some model base of course always nuanced with some expert or some other elements it is uh, key to know what is the data that would be available to us. Uh, most of the data comes from TSOs, but essentially what we have is a set of historical network models describing representative situations of the network in Europe for the last three years. Uh, so from 2018, 19 and 20, this is on the one hand. And um, relevantly or even more relevantly, if you like, we will have the results of the LMPs analysis simulations conducted by TSOs for the target year 2025. This is not yet with us. TSOs, as I said, are working on that, and this information will arrive to us at a later stage. With the available input data, um, the two main tools that will be used by Acer are the following two. Uh, on the one hand, we have so-called flow decomposition. Flow decomposition allows to assess the extent to which different building zone configurations contribute to so-called non-allocated flows essentially loop flows and internal flows and therefore to identify if different how different configurations consume cross-zonal capacity with intrazonal exchanges and therefore going to the detriment or not of the principle of maximizing cross-zonal capacity then we also have of course a clustering techniques uh, that this actually it would be key to um, know where to trace the lines if you like so the first one may eventually be used as i explained in the next coming slides the flow decomposition mostly to, to look at where the focus should be of the review but the second is more where the, the lines should be drawn um, and on that um, aspect the idea is of course to um, look at the um, marginal price locational marginal pricing analysis and to cluster individual nodes into building into building zones the state of, of the status of this project of this part will be presented by our contractors, uh, which are um, currently working on this. But of course, the study is not finalized. Also, knowing that we still uh, need to receive some data. Um, overall, and this is important to be aligned with regulation. The co we understand that the combination of the two tools allows establishing a cost-effect relationship between the physical and commercial congestions, to which I referred at the beginning of my intervention in line with the definition of congestions in regulation. I can now move to the next slide. Yeah. So one important element to consider before going to the next and final slide is like present the overall approach, but before going into that, um, it is important to reflect and to, to explain transparently on the treatment of member state borders when defining configurations. Here, there are two opposing approaches and somewhere in between is ACER's proposed approach circle. One extreme on the left would be to completely disregard member state borders. This is normally called the greenfield type of configurations. This would present the main advantage that the clustering algorithm based on that approach is not constrained at all and therefore is a blank paper whereby the algorithm could determine uh, configurations without unlimited boundaries. Uh, we we be, clearly believe that this presents, in theory, this is a, 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 a potentially good approach, but it presents in practice many uh, challenges that are not obviously uh, addressed. The first one, and they are not negligible, uh, and this explains our choice. The first one is a number of arbitrary choices are to be made. For example, one would need to determine aspects such as the target number of building zones or the size or the granularity, uh, which are aspects that are difficult to agree upon. Then it presents implementation challenges, uh, for example, with regards to a, the possibility of having LFC blocks, LF low frequency control blocks uh, spamming across, across member states, which is something on which there is no much experience in Europe. And also, there is no experience in Europe with building zones combining parts of member states, with the main exception, we refer to parts of member states, to the single energy market of Ireland, 
that was a very special case, uh, not any longer, strictly speaking, because of the Brexit, but at least formally speaking, it, it is still there. Uh, and this was a special case, as I said, uh, being Ireland uh, and Ireland. The other extreme would be to keep bidding zones fully aligned with member states' borders, that is pretty much or very close to the current situation. ACES proposal is to consider a member states' borders, but only as a partial boundary condition. So what, what this would mean in practical terms for our approach and for our, for our uh, for this for this bidding zone review, it's, uh, with this approach, splits of bidding zones within member states would be possible or are possible. Mergers of bidding zones within member states, in this case, for example, for Sweden, would be possible. But mergers of member states or parts of member states are not considered. We we believe that once the main issue structural congestion is resolved future bidding zone reviews could indeed identify potential member states mergers or mergers of parts of member states. The main advantages that we see in this approach, first of all, uh, we believe that it's in line with the main objective and the focus of the electricity regulation for this bidding zone review that is addressing congestions efficiently and increasing personal capacity. Second, um, it is easier to prioritize configurations to be studied and it leaves um, less room for arbitrary choices. And, the, and third, and important, is there is experience in Europe with bidding zones within member states. For example, we have the Swedish or the Italian case uh, currently in Europe. Still, it presents some challenges. Um, there are still some choices to be made. Uh, while the electricity regulation provides some guidance, I will come back to that in next sli next slide on what this guidance or this uh, uh, elements help to to uh, to have a clear path, a clear target, and choices to be made. A and the other challenge uh, that is also helped to some extent by electricity regulation is the need to prioritize alternative configurations and combinations of them to be studied. I will indeed now keep on this slide that describes the high-level approach that we intend to follow. Um, I have to say, I, I will explain now, this is, as you can see, it's based on a, a, a sequence of steps. The main challenge, actually, of course, is already challenging itself, is, is to identify alternatives. But the main challenges, the main challenge are for after the discussions that we had with, with TSOs and NRAs uh, so far, is actually not to identify them. I mean, this with some good work, they can be identified. The main problem, actually, is how to prioritize uh, the configurations to be studied among the many, if not infinite, combinations that can be identified. And this is actually what this process tried to do. Um, in particular, because this is, we, we should bear in mind that this is an European review, it's not a national review where there are limited set of possibilities, for example, like would be the case in Italy, where a, um, they have the, or possibly they had the advantage that it was limited in scope, still with some of some uh, difficulties and the lessons learned from there that of course are useful for the rest of Europe. But the, the key aspect is how, how to prioritize. So in essence, the approach is an iterative one with an, that envisages three steps. The first step intends actually to select the bidding zone or member state that is the focus of the analysis for its iteration. This is important. So this is an iterative st step so for its iteration where the clustering algorithm will uh, identify configurations, there would it would only be focused on one member state. But this, of course, does not mean that the whole analysis would only focus on one. The whole analysis will focus on the entire Europe uh, after doing the whole set of steps. So the first step is about ranking, actually. And bidding zones would be ranked according to two indicators that are in line with the regulatory principles that I explained at the beginning. A first indicator refers to how each bidding zone contributes uh, to uh, maximize cross zonal capacity. Essentially, if a given bidding zone consumes capacity on the so-called next critical network elements in the form of loop flows and internal flows coming from both from intrazonal exchanges. This would be indicator number one. A second indicator refers to economic efficiency. Um, to, though this still needs to be a uh, finalized, but uh, Typical proxy 
for efficiency uh, in light of the data we have. And of course, given, having in mind that here the intention is not to do a bidding zone review because this can only be done later. Uh, so we need to, um, to live with the information we have and not, we cannot have, for example, a market simulation because this is actually something reserved for the bidding zone review. So in absence of this uh, ideal process where we would do, of course, uh, uh, be able to do a market simulation, the best, uh, second best is to rely on the results from the LMP simulations and a good indicator for efficiency is to assess the nodal price differentials within a bidding zone, the locational marginal price differential. In this respect, high price differential would suggest congestions within a bidding zone, while low or homogeneous, or even in the ideal case, no price differentials or at the nodal level would suggest absence of congestions within this bidding zone or absence of impacts of this bidding zone on network elements elsewhere. So this would be the first step where the poorest performing bidding zone or member state uh, would be selected uh, for, uh, for a study or well, for identifying configurations. In a second step, once this bidding zone or member state is selected, it, the bidding zone would be subject to the clustering algorithm and it, it will, the algorithm will try to identify an optimal split in this case within the original bidding zone or member state. An important remark here is that in the case of countries that are already split, such uh, Sweden, for example, I, I'm leaving a little as a bit aside Italy because Italy underwent a bidding zone review at least for the southern part if we exclude Italy North. But I, I prefer to put the focus here on Sweden because uh, it's indeed part of, of the review uh, as well, and, and there were some proposals in there. Uh, what I wanted to say is that the, the, this approach would indeed or might potentially uh, allow for merging of existing bidding zones or a resuffling of bidding zones because for this analysis the whole country would be considered together and not it would not focus only on individual splits i, I wanted to make this point clear uh, so this would be the steps so this would be a recurrent and iterative process uh, whereby of course after each split the new assessment would be only based on the new situation with regard to the existing and the newly identified bidding zones and the iterations would continue until a sufficient number of configurations are identified or the, what we call the targets are met. What are the targets? Well, the targets refer to the indicators I mentioned at the beginning. And again, relate to the two indicators of capacity uh, in light of the 70%. So if all, ideally, all uh, network elements that are relevant in capacity calculation uh, um, have 70% capacity free uh, to be offered, uh, for cross channel exchanges and a proxy for economic efficiency reached its optimal uh, that could be assimilated to a very limited price differentials, nodal price differentials within a bidding zone or zero in an ideal case. We do not expect in practice that this would play, these targets would play a, a determinant role mostly because we believe that before reaching such target, um, we will have sufficient iterations to identify configuration so that this will be probably be enough. Two a very final remarks that are relevant um, a, to explain the, the, the process. When proposing configurations, even though this process that I explained, it focuses on individual and incremental changes, we will combine individual changes into alternative configurations. And we will do th that based on those individual changes that a priori uh, um, uh, offer the biggest improvements in light of the indicators I mentioned. So we will try to combine those in a way that the improvements are expected to be the, to be the best. Um, for areas where so, some expert, finally, this is a final remark, eventually preempting some questions, but still uh, we will answer them later if needed in um, any question that, that may come. For areas where some expert-based configurations were proposed, uh, at least formally, and at least for the, this was the case for the Nordics, we would still aim to consider them for this decision. So on the one hand, we would have the outcome, at least for the Nordics, because elsewhere there were no proposals made. Uh, but for the Nordics, we would have on the one hand the outcome of our um, method and the outcome of the proposal. We would still aim to a test or analyze them in light of the indicators we have and if the proposal 
appear to be at least as good or even better than the ones we propose, we are happy to consider or select the best candidates among the two processes, the expert based on the one hand and this more model based approach. That would be all from my side, from my side for now. Uh, I would now give the floor, give the floor to Polytechnic of Torino, Gianfranco Kiko, and I would be happy to answer questions later on. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everybody. If we can move to the slide. Okay. Let's talk about uh, clustering, which is uh, uh, the method that we use inside this process. As you may know, clustering is a procedure that starts from uh, a population of entities and the scope is to partition them into groups that are consistent with respect to some characteristics we are considering. In particular, these characteristics, these relevant variables are called features. What you see here in the figure is a very simple conceptual example. We have a number of points, and by using the methodology, at the end, we reach a given number of clusters. The number of clusters can be imposed since the beginning or can be the result of uh, uh, an, a threshold based approach. In the specific case, in our specific case, the entities we are considering are the nodes of the transmission system, while the features are some meaningful quantities for the study we will uh, recall a little later. The activity we are uh, carrying out uh, is, is an activity that started, of course, from a literature review and from previous experiences we had. Next slide, please. Okay, about the features, we consider it as features of interest, nodal prices, which are mostly used in the literature and are, uh, are features with technical and economic relevance. And these features are available for a number of time intervals during the period of observation. Uh, same thing about the shadow prices, uh, less common in the literature maybe, but they can provide further insights uh, based on economics. And then we have uh, power transfer distribution factors, PTDFs, which are again used to some extent in the literature and uh, typically poorly technical. Next slide. Here there are the main approaches uh, we have found from the literature review. We have partitioned them into three classes, the, the general classes. The first one is the one in which uh, there is a scenario-based clustering, and in this case, data are available as time series for groups of time periods. We, we can have time periods uh, that are uh, sequential or blocks of time periods that refer to different seasons uh, or different years, and uh, especially for different climatic areas. And there is a, a group of uh, articles in the literature that solve clustering for this, uh, for this uh, type of data with different techniques. Then we have single case clustering in which there is a single snapshot or, or, or single time series which is provided in the data and other approaches including application of non-clustering methods, uh, for example, of optimization problems set up in a different way or graph search procedures. Next one. Again, from the literature review, there is a distinction between two types of methods. The first type are deterministic methods. And uh, as we know, in deterministic methods, the solution depends on the choices of the parameters, but remains the same if the parameters don't change. A typical example is hierarchical clustering with different uh, linkage criteria, with different uh, variants. Then another uh, part is the probability-based methods. And the solution here depends on the user choices, on the parameters, of course, but also on the extraction of random numbers during the execution. So this means that the, the solution changes also if the parameters don't change. 
Of course, there is the possibility of blocking the so-called seed for random number extraction and making uh, the solution repeatable. Uh, however, when we apply this uh, solution, we, we uh, leave the random number extractors changing the extractions, we may have different solutions. And in this case, uh, a single uh, solution of the probability-based methods is not the best thing to do because we have a solution that may be very different with respect to another one. So the algorithm is typically to be run multiple times, then making a statistical analysis of the results. Examples in this case are many uh, well-known clustering algorithms like k-means, k-means, uh, k-means, also meta-heuristic based algorithms, and also the last stage of the spectral clustering, which is a, a very interesting clustering algorithm for our purposes, but the last stage is solved in the classical approach by k-means. Next one. So what we have to do here is a scenario-based analysis because we have the data organized in such a way to deal with these scenarios. So in, in the activity we are continuing, let's take here nodal prices as an, an example. We have multi-period scenarios. So the main criteria for selecting the scenarios is the climate year. We have different years of reference. And for each climate year, they, we have a number of months considered, or even the whole uh, year, even all the months of the year. And this uh, also allows representing different seasonality effects, if any. And uh, within each month, we have the features that are available as hourly data for given days, or uh, if possible, for all uh, the hours of the day. And these scenarios are handled on the basis of the relevance of the information. So the scenarios provide a variety of information on different operating conditions. There are cases in which there are congestions, other cases in which there is no congestion, uh, variable situations. And uh, if we have uh, hours uh, in which the, all the features we are considering are uh, equal for all the nodes, we can exclude them because if all the elements are equal, all the differences uh, between them are zero, and so this gives no information for the clustering algorithm. Next one, please. Okay, here we have the differences between the problem and the clustering algorithm that are used classically. So the clustering algorithm that we will use here is not a classical one because the classical algorithms have limitations that uh, don't uh, allow us using these methods uh, as they are. So first of all, at each step of the iterative process, we have that a given geographical area will be divided into a limited number of clusters. We will start uh, with two, uh, and then we will see whether uh, we can do it with three and, and a few more. While typical algorithms are, are used to form many clusters uh, in the literature. The second one, the second uh, particularity is uh, uh, as the target number of clusters is provided as an input of each step. So we will know whether we have to partition into two or three and so forth. We will not address one of the classical problems of clustering, which is the identification of the best number of clusters by, by using suitable indicators. Even so, this is a, a quite uh, challenging task uh, for uh, clustering, for basic clustering is one of the problems to assess the best number of clusters. In this case, we will know uh, since the beginning that we will partition into two or three or, or, or whatever, uh, small numbers. And so we will not have the possibility of going in that direction. Then we have data that refer to multi-period scenarios, and these scenarios have to be handled together in some, in some way. And this is something more with respect to uh, the huge classical usage of a clustering algorithms in which we have a matrix of inputs uh, and some outputs. In our case, of course, we will have a matrix of inputs, uh, but these inputs will have to be uh, reasoned, or also we will have to perform multiple executions of the clustering for different scenarios, and then we will have to combine them together. These are some directions we are following. 
Uh, another key point is that uh, we have co additional constraints. In a classical clustering algorithm, we have the features, and typically the features uh, are sufficient to uh, reach the cluster results, and there is no information on the connection between the points. Here we have a network. So we have information on the network topology, and these are additional constraints, and we have to incorporate uh, these additional points. Uh, typically, we cannot just run the clustering algorithm ignoring the presence of the connections and then try to arrange things uh, uh, after, uh, after having the results. We need to incorporate uh, these uh, links, uh, these, uh, these, these connections given from the topology inside the clustering algorithm since the beginning in order to avoid uh, uh, running the clustering and then uh, having to solve uh, the constraints. Uh, last here is uh, as at each iteration of the process, uh, for a given uh, geographical area, we have we'll have the split into a limited number of clusters. There are the conditions for testing also some variants of clustering that are less commonly used in the literature. For example, top-down uh, methods. Uh, with respect to the classical bottom-up algorithms. And these are the reasons why the solution that we will use is not conventional, it's not a conventional cluster. So we have much to work to customize the solution algorithms according to our purposes. Next slide, please. This is an example from previous activity. This is a published result. Uh, we, we did an activity uh, which is in progress in Italy, and this is a recent application. Just to give an idea, we have in this case uh, used the probabilistic multi scenario methodology using as features the nodal prices calculated for optimal power flow with security constraints as PTDFs. Then we have scenarios that are defined from the solutions in normal operation and also in some planned and maintenance cases. And these uh, scenarios are weighted by the expected frequency of occurrence. We use some clustering algorithms uh, for each scenario, and in each case, we obtain the partitioning, of course, into clusters. Then from here, we form the similarity matrix by considering the network data, by considering other information like how many times the nodes belong to the same cluster, and scenario weights, and so forth. And we sent this similarity matrix to a spectral clustering algorithm, which was executed to form the final number of zones. And you can see also an example for four clusters here of one of the results we had. Uh, this is uh, uh, one example of methodology, which is not necessarily the one we will use here, because uh, here we will start from uh, mm, from splitting the zones uh, at, e at each iteration, as we saw in the process. So uh, the method itself uh, and the, the arrangements and internal arrangement, the customization of the clustering algorithms could be different. Next slide, please. OK, so basically, we are testing two types of approaches. One is the so-called graph-based clustering in which we are constructing a data similarity graph that is based on the relationship among the data. And then we are creating the groups by using a graph theoretic optimization. And on the other side, there is the concept of constrained clustering in which there is the incorporation in the procedure of the node connection in the network. And this basically works in such a way that we are avoiding solutions in which the groups of nodes created are not connected. Avoiding means that we are uh, trying to set up uh, some steps in the solutions in which these, so these cases in which the groups of nodes created are not connected are even not generated during the process. So we don't have to, uh, to, to um, uh, cancel them, we don't have to re remove them. Uh, after the calculations, we are trying to create only groups of nodes that are already connected by using uh, customization uh, arrangements. Next slide, please. So this is a conclusion on clustering. 
considering the aspects we have recalled in the previous slides, the definition of the clustering algorithms is not just a choice among some existing algorithms. And we will have a selection of the algorithm that depends on data and has always to be carefully assessed with the data at hand. So before saying this is the clustering algorithm that is useful for this problem, we need to see the real data and to, and to play with them. And the decision of the most, on the most suitable clustering algorithm will be possible only after a detailed testing on the system, which is based on the full data available. We are considering different solutions and customizations. We have this, uh, another point here. In some cases, we can think that deterministic clustering procedures are, are of interest because their results do not depend on random variables. And in this case, the statistical analysis, the result is not needed. And also the solution is uh, uh, repeatable because in deterministic methods, uh, the solution doesn't change. And we are customizing, as I told you already, the clustering procedures, and these procedures will be included in the testing. So this is uh, the, uh, the general uh, scheme of what we are doing for clustering. Thank you. And I can give back the word to the next speaker. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, I think we, we can move now to the Q&A part of the webinar. Um, um, and I will start maybe uh, with uh, the, 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 the first question, um, because uh, yeah, I, I see that there are many uh, chat about this, this question. Uh, the, the question was, um, in case there is a, a significant um, uh, indication uh, to that uh, in one country that we need to, to to move uh, okay uh, that we can um, uh, change the, the bidding zone in one country uh, is there any explicit limitation from a member state to 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 not to move ahead and and uh, whether does this member state need to 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 uh, to wait for the the european uh, uh, bidding zone review process so the answer to this question is pretty clear in the in the regulation that if if you have a if a member state identifies a, a structural uh, congestion an internal structural congestion um, is free to 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 change the bidding zone uh, configuration in its country uh, the only requirement is to to coordinate with the neighboring countries and uh, in case there, there is an impact on, on, on the neighboring countries, um, uh, it, it has to involve the, the other member state in the decision-making process. It has to consult all stakeholders and it has to notify uh, its decision, its reason decision to the European Commission and to ACER. So the answer to your question, uh, Ricard, is that if one member state uh, identify a structural congestion within its country, it can move uh, forward and 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 uh, and and adapt the bidding zone configuration to the extent that this has no uh, 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 big impact on the on the neighboring countries. So he's not obliged to to wait for the 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 European bidding zone review process. Um, there was another question about UK. Um, could you elaborate on how the flow analysis is handled with the with UK? And if it is in some way, and whether it, it, it can impact the bidding zone configuration proposed uh, later on. Um, Rafa, maybe you want to handle this one? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, so the case of UK, um, even though the process started at a point in time where UK had not left, the Brexit was not uh, uh, formally materialized yet, in practical terms, the review would take place, and of course, the decision at a point in time where the Brexit is already a fact. So for that reason, 
UK is not formally part of the review, other than it flows from UK, the same as flows from third countries are considered in the analysis, uh, typically as a single note, uh, but not with a view to perform any flow decomposition for, for UK or any, or any, any clustering. So it, it, it only be considered as, in this case, as a third country for, for modeling purposes uh, only. Thank you, Rafa. Uh, another question. Did you, for you, Rafa, did you consider leaving the concept of bidding zone at, uh, all together and go for uh, uh, a nodal system? Um, I mean, if it is um, in the sense of, uh, so maybe to clarify, the simulations um, are performed with a view to propose configurations in the context of the review. So the, the nodal price simulations is a full nodal price simulation to the extent that TSOs have the capability to simulate as many nodes as possible. But it is not meant, or this is not uh, among the objectives to use the, the bidding zone review as a tool to promote uh, a move to nodal because it would be way far uh, to, be, to be realistic in the next coming in the, in the in the short term, so it it is not uh, this is not a purpose of the of the review. This does not mean that in the future this could be part of the any future market solution, but this is not for the for the uh, foreseeable future for sure. Thank you. Um, another question: Why are merger of member states or parts of a member state excluded in this bidding zone review, um, but potentially considered in future reviews? Uh, is there a possibility that merger could score highly in terms of, uh, of the market efficiency criteria? Yeah, so I, I, I'm on mute. Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, on this on this one, I, 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 we, we try to explain, but, but of course we, we, we can explain again. So first, um, Mergers are allowed within member states, but it is true, as the, as the question says, that uh, the, the, there is no the possibility of mergers of member states or parts of member states are not envisaged at this stage. We don't see this advisable, um, and mostly we believe that it's a matter of order and timing. And I think I think that here is important, in particular, knowing that there is a limited number of configurations that can be investigated. The main pressing issue at this moment in Europe, and this is highlighted all over the place, I think it's obvious that it is, or one of the most obvious, is, is the issue of congestion, so how to handle them in an efficient manner. Um, we do not question that at a point in time, mergers could, uh, could bring some benefits at some point, but we should build things in, our, in the right order. First, we should actually be able to address congestions. And if there are mergers to be made, they will naturally emerge uh, later on. Uh, what we don't see as, because when we talk about mergers, I think that everyone has, or has um, normally uh, something in mind specifically. What we clearly do not see is, do not see obvious benefits in promoting mergers, or we do not see the social benefits other than potentially one benefit could be increased liquidity in forward markets, but we do not see that benefits if such an increase of liquidity is based on an underlying product that do not, or that does not represent the physical reality. So this is to say, let's first make sure that all underlying products represent the physical reality to the best, best extent possible, and then the market will naturally illustrate if there are potential mergers to be made. But let's not do it the other way around. That's trying to promote mergers without perhaps a, a not having resolved the underlying problem. And then it's very difficult to undo this process because once you do you take such a decision, then you enter into, into problems that are difficult. And, and of course, any change comes with some effort. So that's, that's how we see it. Uh, we, we, of course, are very sensitive to the issue of liquidity. We know it's important, but we believe that the, the, the strongly believe that the first reason why the bidding zone reviews there is to address congestions. And once this is done, all other aspects need to be looked at. And of course, liquidity will be looked at during the review. Okay, thank you, Rafa. Then uh, there are two 
question on the LMP simulation. Um, LMP simulation are trying to capture what may happen in the future and are at best an informed scenario analysis. How does ACER foresee a transparent selection process? And, 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 and to which extent uh, this uh, LMP simulation will be built on the, the approach uh, uh, done for the, the first bidding zone uh, review process? Mm -hmm. So it is important to say, and this indeed was not mentioned during the presentation today. So the LMP analysis is, uh, I mean, first, it's to the extent possible, it builds upon the lessons learned from the first bidding zone review and the LMP analysis done there. Uh, in the bidding zone review methodology, and we try to do, we try to do our best in incorporating a, spe a specific article on how to perform the LMP analysis for this for the purpose of this review. As, a, as an input for defining configurations, but also during the review, because during the review, the LMP analysis would also bring a couple of indicators that may be relevant, or actually will be relevant as part of the analysis. So it's defined there, it builds upon the uh, lessons learned and the challenges that the first business on review presented. And I think that the most important aspect here is that, um, the, of course, there are challenges, and of course, any, any simulation is imperfect by definition. At the same time, any um, aspect that can be solved now during the, the, uh, the nodal price simulation needs to be resolved anyway for the bidding zone review itself. The bidding zone review, uh, an important part of it is a modeling chain with many different challenges. And the challenges of the bidding zone review is in general uh, not so uh, different from the, from the nodal price one. So any aspect that is resolved now it uh, will help also to make the bidding zone rev review more robust. And finally, in terms of uh, uh, scenarios or selection or choices, well, there are the, the, the methodology tries to describe, in some cases, some prescriptive elements, and all, some others are left open to TSOs. But just to mention one, uh, one aspect that is left open, but is in a way TSOs have already worked on that, is the selection of the relevant climate sphere to be simulated. And in that respect, there are three climate years to be uh, chosen. So TSOs with their best capability would chose would choose uh, among uh, would choose three among all historical, and this 2025 scenario would be best based on their best forecast that is typically used for other purposes, uh, and then these 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 climate years in line with the methodology. Okay. No the, yeah. Thank you, Rafa. Um... Then a question about the 70% target. Could you confirm that uh, this target uh, uh, only applies to limiting uh, critical network element? For how many hours do you accept? Will you accept an, an, an overshoot, which could be managed by uh, um, uh, redispatching and, and counter trading? Uh, and, and how about the the exchange with uh, third countries, in, in, uh, how, how will these exchanges with third country be taken into account uh, in, in this high level approach? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that the, the easy answer is uh, uh, we, we don't, I mean, we, we, I know we explained this, 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 this aspect of the 70%. Uh, I think that everyone assumes that there will always be a need for a limited application of remedial actions. I think it's not realistic to believe that for all hours, uh, uh, for, uh, there will not be a need of, of applying remedial actions. And actually the 70% is not, is not in conflict with that rule. It simply says that, it, well, the 70% is there, needs to be achieved. However, the bidding zone review in a way aims to see to the extent possible how the market can resolve congestions without the need to rely on, on remedial actions. So this is, this is the concept. So the, in that respect, the 70% is more sort of a target, a direction to be taken. And as I said in the, in the presentation, we don't expect that we will reach as, uh, the sufficient number of iterations where all, uh, all the targets, all the 70% target is met on all next for all hours uh, without remedial action. There will always be an issue. So we, we, don't, we don't believe that this will, that the end will, be, will play a role as such. It will be a, a target to be met, an orientation, an objective, but not. Uh, that it's necessarily, it's strictly speaking, necessary to have a perfect building zone configuration. Uh, and maybe answering to the question on, on, on limiting next, 
Uh, well, not exactly. I cannot confirm the way this is actually written. So, in principle, all necks that are considered in capacity calculation. This is because this specific indicator aims to capture um, the ability of building zones to contribute or not to increase capacity in general. And if we want to consider other other instances, other elements such as efficiency, we have perfectly well the, the aspects of prices that is much more powerful and is the second indicator. So I think this is covered. With respect to third countries, here we would, in principle, align with all our previous claims. Uh, this is a, a, a EU, a EU, um, a, 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 you review so uh, exchanges from third countries will be considered as long as there are agreements in line with previous European Commission guidance on the matter, just to consider them on equal foot. That is how they will be considered. Okay, thank you. Um, then the next question in Europe, we have um, small and large uh, bidding zones. Um, Will the algorithm, will the process uh, be robust against favoring uh, either the small or, or the large, large uh, bidding zone, the large member states? Um, yeah, if, even though it's about the algorithm, I think that this question is, is still for us uh, because it, it refers to the sort of this is when we talk about assumptions. Now, this is one of the assumptions. Uh, we are aware of this issue, and the way we see it is as follows. Um, we would not use the size of the business zone as a criterion itself. I mean, of course, first one would need to define what is size first, but it's already a tricky aspect. Uh, of course, size, it does not refer to the geographical size, but it, if any, it would refer to the amount of generation or load or a combination of both in an area or the number of nodes, for example. Um, however, having said that, we are actually considering it's likely to be a question for the public consultation uh, to consider it as a soft constraint in, to the algorithm. In what sense? Well, I, I think it's a relatively well-known issue and I, it was uh, transparently stated by PW generates, if not TSOs as well, that when there is a systematic or very large different size of bidding zones, this potentially leads to a systematic uh, deviation of welfare in favor of larger building zones. Uh, this leads to some debates about even patches on the on the flow-based algorithm that should be avoided in principle. So having said that, we don't see this as a as an objective in itself. In particular in Europe it's hard to to, uh, to put this as an objective. I wouldn't see a case where a, a, a building zone or a country is split just for the mere fact of being big or small. However, when it is about defining new building zones, it could make sense to have a soft constraint to at least make sure that the newly created building zones are not very different in size to, to precisely uh, avoid this problem that I mentioned of potential discrimination uh, of uh, in a flow-based context in particular of uh, large and small building zones. So th that would be possibly our approach, that a soft constraint where we would avoid large differences, differences for the newly created or newly proposed ones. <clears throat> Okay, thank you, Rafael. Um, then uh, another question. In general, the market sees the grid as a copper plate. If we had a copper plate, no problem would arise with a one node market uh, as global model for the whole European electricity uh, network, including a market coupling covering, covering all countries. But there is an electric power network which has uh, transmission constraints. Uh, so the question is, what, instead of um, uh, trying to to adapt the bidding zone, why don't we try to fix the problem with uh, um, grid uh, fees first, and, and then to develop uh, uh, fees, grid fees uh, that would give financial incentive to to take care of the um, of the bottlenecks. I, I I I think that this goes down to the target model, no? Like, what is the, the target model in visiting Europe? I think it was always considered as more powerful, more accurate, and um, more sort of promoting competition to have the right price signals given first. Of course, price signals can also be given by network tariffs, and they may play a complementary role. Uh, but it's difficult to to agree that 
network tariffs would be as accurate, in particular because they typically need to be set ex ante based on a number of assumptions. Uh, and even though they could still bring some loca residual locational signals, I think that the, the whole target model is based upon the assumption that the best way to promote competition and to ensure the reaction in real time of uh, both load and generation is to have uh, the, uh, these signals embedded in the market rather than this other approach that could be in other parts of the world, but I think it was a, a choice made in Europe a long time ago. And indeed, the bidding zone uh, represents, uh, as I said before uh, in my introduction, a cornerstone of the uh, an efficient uh, internal electricity market. Um, <clears throat> Next question. So, one advantage of the of the LMP clustering approach should be to take a more objective pan-European view. Um, will the clustering exercise uh, just be done per region? So, this is the first question. And then, will a bidding zone be selected uh, cluster by predefining a number of bidding zones per region? For example, three, six, uh, or, or nine. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So in terms of the regions, it's the same as for the bidding zone review. I mean, there were a number of regions defined ex ante that were accepted with the strong condition that whatever analysis would be done would have to consider still the rest of Europe in a simplified manner to capture uh, European welfare benefits. So this means that if the Nordics, for example, model their network accurately, they still have to model the neighboring areas to ensure that whatever change still goes to the benefit of EU uh, market participants. Uh, the same applies approximately for the nodal price simulation, which of course in principle should be consistent. Uh, they are the only, there was only a small like sort of difference. So, uh, I mean, through the talks with TSOs, it was uh, requested to um, split the nodal price simulation per synchronous area for sort of combination of modeling and experience reasons. And, and ability to coordinate. So there are now currently two uh, uh, ongoing uh, LMP simulations in parallel. One is for the Nordics, and another one is for continental Europe. Uh, still, uh, in both cases, the neighboring countries, as I said, needs to be considered, and also for the review. Uh, and finally, in terms of the number of configurations, there is no a target in terms of the number of building zones. What there is a target is a reasonable amount of configurations to be studied. Uh, this means that, I mean, uh, the ability of TSOs to, to perform as any anyone else is, is limited, so they would have to, we have to be selected. Uh, and for each region, the number could be somewhere between five and 10, eventually 10 in the, in the, uh, in the maximum number. And it could also be that in some regions, if it is found that there, is, that there are no obvious congestion issues, eventually for some, regions of Europe, there is no configurations proposed. But this is to be seen, and we'll try to be as consistent as possible when taking this decision on the number of configurations across Europe. And this is one of the key elements here, is like to try to not be, not to be discretionary in the, in the decision. Um, thank you. Then there is a, a next question, I think, not sure whether this is about the the, the target here, um, 2025. So uh, with the Green Deal, the EU has a strong impulse uh, that will evolve in dynamic changes in the next years. Um, how are the Green Deal uh, objective and the changes in the electricity system? Uh, how will this uh, be uh, taken into consideration in the bedding zone review? And, and, and especially uh, regarding the choice of the target here, which will be an analyzed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, first, the, the regulation gives an answer about the target year because this is this is in regulation set in stone. It's 20, it has to be three years after. Uh, with regards to to the to the consideration of a, uh, investment on renewables, for example, uh, there was an addition of um, of a criteria in addition to the CACAM criteria to uh, try analyzing the impacts of the review on uh, investments in general, including investments on renewables. There, the focus taken was actually mostly about uh, having the right locational price signals. I and mean, we are strongly convinced that uh, 
the Green Deal in general and anything related to investments is better served or more efficiently served if the locational, right locational price signals are there. So this, this in a way is the line to take. Um, and then if the question goes beyond that, like how to make sure that uh, many different objectives are reconciled, and this relates to how to have a stable framework for investment, investments for 20 years, for a, also to, uh, to ensure sufficient liquidity um, uh, compatible with, uh, with more granularity of bidding zones. I think that then there is a need to go beyond this bidding zone review and also question whether there are the aspects of market design that could be enhanced, and this might include the forward market design, for example, uh, but it also, it also is also a question for investments in general, how to reconcile these elements uh, or how to, to make the best of market design to ensure that on the one hand, we have the best of the two worlds, the best of good price signals that are sufficiently granular and accurate, and at the same time, how to serve investments and how to serve liquidity in the, in the long run. So these are aspects that need to be thought more from a, in our view, from a market design perspective, but it cannot be the bidding some reviews a tool to solve all, pro, all problems of the world if I can put it this way. Okay. Um, maybe I will move now to the, the, the question and maybe I will come back uh, to you, uh, Rafael, later on. Uh, there are a few questions for um, Gianfranco. Um, uh, when you mention literature, there are numerous papers uh, for this subject. Uh, um, we have built on the work of Polish National Center for Nuclear Research Pro uh, Project managed by the NVGL. Is this what you mean when you mention uh, literature, Gianfranco? So when I'm mentioning literature, I mentioned dozens of papers uh, and uh, reports we have uh, taken into account to, to summarize uh, our findings. So it's uh, quite uh, a large uh, analysis that we did. And we extracted the, the dominant principles uh, and we reached the conclusions that the clustering algorithms that are used in general are uh, insufficient. And we have extracted the, the lessons learned from the clustering algorithms that have been applied to this problem. And we are now synthesizing uh, uh, the, the solution also taking into account that uh, recently there is uh, a development uh, of uh, new uh, variants of algorithms that uh, are very efficient for graph-based clustering and for constraint clustering as types of clustering algorithms. So we are following also what happens uh, in the general literature and not only the literature applied uh, to the specific problem. Thank you. Um, another question for you. Uh, which model will be used for calculating the LMPs? And, and can we have details on, on their features? Uh, this, this doesn't come from us, so the response has to be given by, uh, by others. I mean, we, we take the uh, data already, so how they are calculated. The, we receive data, but I, I would... Uh, Leave Rafa respond to this because it's the ACER, uh, the ACER part. Yeah, can you? I was distracted. Sorry, can, can you repeat the question, uh, Christoph? Yeah. Which model will be used for calculating LMPs and can we have details on their, on their features? The, I mean, I, I meant I replied before. So the, the methodology to uh, estimate to do the LMP process is defined in the art. Article 11, I believe, of our decision on the bidding zone review methodology. So it's publicly available and it yeah. can be seen there. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question for you, Gianfranco. Uh, are you thinking of open source clustering uh, algorithm? What we will transfer to ACER will be the code. So then uh, again, is ACER that has to uh, respond on what to do with the code. Thank you, Gianfranco. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, 
as a matter of principle, Acer is always in favor of transparency and also when it comes to, to you know, to, to the work we do. Uh, we have not envisaged as such the publication of the code fully, uh, but I think we, a priori we don't have to exclude that possibility or, or at least a sufficient mm -hmm. good description so that is understood what is done there. Uh, we'll see how to, at, at this point, it has not been among our priorities to be frank, um, like how to go around uh, this aspect, but uh, I, I think it's, as a matter of principle, it should not be an issue. It's more the how rather than what, whether or not. Okay. Um, <clears throat> then maybe um, another question for you, uh, Rafa. Um, plants with the uh, same technologies in different member states might be subject to different rules and taxations um, that will lead to different uh, bidding strategy. Um, so, could this lead uh, to unfair competition when merging zones of, of different uh, member states? Well, to, to some extent, this would be more a question for TSOs because they are the ones who have the data, but I mean, as, as we, the question comes to us. A, in principle, the process w was not envisaged to simulate bidding behavior because this is far from where it's on. all all types of of modeling, at least, well, not all types, but the ones that would be at reach of TSOs in a reasonable amount of time and reasonable robust would be mostly cost based. So aspects that could go beyond. Uh, these that affecting bidding behavior would not be a priori considered. It would be, uh, this indeed could eventually lead some distortion out, distortions out, but here the focus is mostly on efficiency. And if there are distortions, they need to be addressed in a different context. So it is mostly a cost-based approach, of course, trying to incorporate all elements of cost as much as possible. And then there is a, thank you, Rafa. There is a question about, um, um, the development of offshore wind, uh, and the question is whether this uh, bidding zone uh, review process will be robust enough uh, uh, to add additional offshore winds, uh, for instance, in in the North Sea. Um, and, and the question is whether, yeah, another question: should a new bidding zone uh, be developed, considered for the offshore wind in the North Sea? Um, maybe I can uh, handle this one. Uh, Indeed, there, there, there might be an impact uh, of uh, the, the development of offshore wind uh, uh, on, on the, the efficient bidding zone configuration. But, but uh, I think, for the time being, we we think that we can uh, we, we can uh, um, uh, uh, disconnect the, the two issues. Uh, this. Uh, Development of offshore winds uh, will take uh, uh, will take time, and and, and uh, I think yeah we, we can uh, uh, we we can separate uh, the the two issues, and and maybe in the future indeed we will need to 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 address all this uh, together. But uh, yeah, I think this is uh, more for the future. Uh, uh, do, do you want to complement on this, Rafa? Or yeah, no, no, exactly what you said. But may, yeah, I mean at this point. We, there doesn't seem to be a, a interaction so far, just because of the timing. But this, in the future, may be different and has to be considered, as you said. Maybe, maybe more of a general reflection not that this um, um, issue of the offshore winds also illustrates, irrespective of whether the framework is the best or there could be nuances on how this framework can be better prepared, and there are others working on that. Uh, but the, possibly the most important element is that there are some some merits on on these approaches and in particular is an indication that locational price signals may bring some benefits so there should not be a fear in general uh, to consider the bidding zone as an adequate tool to to address certain issues in particular when it comes to congestions within uh, member states or in this specific case uh, in the case of offshore so it was a, more of a reflection um, and then there is a, a question about um, um, w w whether this uh, the process we have in mind uh, uh, whether this process will not 
automatically lead to favor uh, the splitting of large bidding zone. Um, yeah, and uh, so is there not a, a, a bias in, in our approach uh, leading uh, to, to a splitting of large bidding zone? And, and, uh, and is the approach should not be uh, more uh, neutral? Uh, I think it's a bit the, the, uh, the answer that, we, that I made at the beginning. The, the approach favors handling what is considered one of the most pressing problems in Europe at the moment, that is the other, how to address congestions. And, and we strongly believe that the building zone review overall is a tool to handle congestions in an efficient manner. Uh, and then other aspects are, need to be analyzed. So to ensure that uh, overall, whatever choice is made is the most beneficial one. But what we clearly want to avoid is a risk uh, that the priority is put somewhere else uh, with no obvious benefits and perhaps uh, difficult to solve afterwards. In particular, the issue of addressing congestion that seems to be uh, the focus of uh, that the electric regulation puts on for this review. Okay. Um, is there uh, clarity on some public document? Uh, sorry. Uh, how would uh, TSOs or ACER conclude on supply and demand order volumes and price elasticities on a nodal basis, given that there is in most countries in Europe, there is no such information to be found, um, except maybe in a, a few countries. And, and the, the fact that the order are based on portfolio bidding on pre-existing bidding zone level. Um, uh, Rafa, do you do you? Yeah. So, so the we always we always so, yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I have a kind of answer. So the uh, we always see the issue of elasticity, price elasticity as relevant, uh, both in the context of uh, the nodal price, but also of the bidding zone review, in particular because it is expected uh, elasticity to play a more important role in the years to come, and, and in 2025, for example, more than today. Our understanding is that already today, there is some elasticity out, out there, and demand is not fully inelastic. Uh, and in particular, in a bidding zone review may play a role because if you have the right price signals, you will not only have generation incentivized to help the system, but also demand to help the system and to consume more where the prices are lower and to consume less uh, when and where the prices are higher. So this is just to say that it's important. We see this as an important feature. I think that there have been some nice studies on what could be the impacts of elasticity when bidding zones are well defined or even a nodal price simulation. Having said that, we acknowledge the, the, the difficulties to come up with information about that, but this is not a reason to consider then as a conclusion elasticity as zero. And this is why the methodology gave different options, some based on uh, European values on st of studies that are there with some assumptions, of course. Uh, and TSOs are given the opportunity, if they have more granular information at the national level to use it, uh, but overall, we, we consider as a key feature. And if uh, this is an element that is considered to have some uncertainty, I think that this is, would be a good candidate, in particular for the bidding zone review, to do that sensitivity analysis, and then to to estimate one, two, three plausible values of elasticity. Maybe not many because the, the time computational time is important, and to have these results against different hypotheses, plausible hypotheses of demand elasticity. And then, based on that, to uh, provide additional information. Okay, um, we have uh, heading toward the end of this uh, Q and A session. Maybe I will finish with two last questions. Um, during the webinar, it was said that in the clustering algorithm, there are parameters that are chosen and that influence the outcome. Could you please clarify what these parameters are and how they are chosen? Uh, is it, for instance, only the number of possible bidding zones, or are there more parameters that have to be chosen before the, the algorithm? Uh, okay. So we have 
two types of solvers. In one case, we are given the number of clusters and then other parameters are referred to the specific method. Uh, an example, here we will have to combine scenarios and also the combination of these scenarios will be one of the focuses of our analysis. How to do that depends on the data on which there is the impact on the data. So we will see when we have the full set of data to analyze what happens. And the ability is to use methods in which we are not fixing directly the number of clusters, but we are fixing thresholds. Thresholds like uh, uh, if we, uh, a given uh, value is uh, below a, a given threshold, the nodes are uh, combined together and in the same group, uh, otherwise they are kept uh, isolated. And this is another uh, type of method. In general, uh, if we have uh, probabilistic uh, methods, in, in there are other parameters that can be uh, typical of the method. In general, we will try to use as less parameters as possible in order to simplify also the fact that we, if we use more parameters, we need the sensitivity analysis, of course. And uh, also we will try to favor deterministic uh, choices uh, just to avoid uh, the issue of doing uh, statistical analysis of the results. But this, uh, this is typically uh, method-based and when we will define our methods, we will start from the underlying principles and then we will favor solutions that are simpler if the results, of course, are consistent. Having a method with many, many parameters to set up, I think, is not so convenient. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gianfranco. Um, maybe one last question for you, Rafa. Uh, it's about the level of coordination between the bidding zone review regions. Uh, is ACER planning to do a sensitivity analysis on the bidding zone uh, review regions being considered for alternative configuration? And more generally, will any sensitivity, sensitivity analysis uh, be, be performed? Hmm. So, Maybe there are two, two, diff two different questions here. In terms of coordination, the best tool for coordination is, is the methodology itself, which in principle should apply to all regions. And the, the second element is uh, the request for TSOs explicitly in, in, as part of this methodology to coordinate on specific aspects. And this ranges from aspects of the simulation chain for example, when it comes to make assumptions about cross-channel capacity, just to mention one element. Uh, but it also uh, applies to, for example, the, the uh, point in time when and how the consultations are made to ensure that there is some consistency and also in, in the, even in the publication of data in the, in the content of the final report. When it comes to sensitivity analysis, um, I don't think that there will be um, cross check of regions, at least not a priori, among other things, uh, because the uh, the uh, the type of configuration that would be studied would be different. Uh, however, that there are sensitivity analysis that would be more go in the direction of uh, looking at the at some the, how some variables can evolve. For example, that the demand was demand elasticity could be one example, or additional climate data if if TSO is deemed necessary. So this is a possibility that exists, but it will be more focused on specific variables rather than trying to do a cross check. Would would possibly be difficult to have a perfect match if I can put it this way. Okay. Um, so we are at the end of this uh, uh, webinar. Um, I would like to thank all the, the, the participants, um, and, and in particular, uh, Rafael, uh, Marco behind the scene, and, and uh, Gianfranco and, and, and Politecnico di, di Torino. Um, as I said at the beginning, uh, this slide pack will be um, uh, 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 sent by email and will be available on the, on the website. Maybe we can move to the, 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 the last uh, slide. 
Um, as mentioned by, by Raphael, um, we will launch uh, early July a public consultation on, on the approach presented to, today. And uh, this consultation will last uh, four weeks. Uh, we expect TSO to deliver the final results of the LMP simulation uh, by the end of, of October 2021. Uh, and then, then the, the, the decision uh, of ASA will fall on the alternative building zone configuration uh, will follow. We expect it to, uh, to be issued in, in the first quarter of 2022. And then the formal building zone review process uh, uh, by TSO uh, will, will start. Um, again, uh, Thank you very much to all of you for your active participation. I hope that we managed to answer uh, most of the questions raised during the, the, the webinar. And if you have uh, uh, further any further question, uh, you have um, a, an electronic address to, to send them. Uh, thank you, and I wish you uh, an excellent uh, day.